Hello, welcome to EMG Chapter 1, Video 2. This video is about some of the basic anatomical terms that you'll need in your research. This is not a medical anatomy course, and we've only got a few minutes. So it's really just a quick introduction to the kind of things you'll need to know to do EMG research. First, we will learn some basic anatomical terms and see how they are applied to different parts of the body, first in a fish, then a bird, dog and in humans. The same anatomical terms are applied to many different animals so it's important to know your way around. They're mostly in Latin. Here's a Picasso triggerfish. The white labels on this picture give you the names for directions in the space around the fish. The front of the fish is the anterior end and the back is the posterior end. In English, posterior is a posh word for bottom or butt, if that helps you to remember. Above the fish is superior, and below the fish is inferior. The words in English mean the same thing. The labels in yellow here are slightly different. So they refer to parts of the fish's body rather than the space around it. So the back of the fish is the dorsal side. Now, if you think of sharks, they have a big dorsal fin. So think of sharks to remember the dorsal side, the back of the fish. The belly of the fish is the ventral side. Now, if you know any French, and you'll forgive my French accent, then think of the word for stomach, or ventre, to remember this one. So the, the ventral side is the stomach side, the belly. The left and right sides of the fish are lateral, while the middle of the fish, along the backbone, is medial. For some additional complexity, bits of the fish that are nearer to something are proximal and further away are distal. So you can think of the English words proximity and distance here. Anatomists, much like German speakers, like to combine already quite long words into even longer word strings. So you can combine the words for the sides and the ends to give axes. So for example, the axis from the head to the tail is the anteroposterior axis, or from the back to the belly is the dorsoventral, or from the side to the middle is the lateromedial, and as well for near to far you can say proximodistal, and so on. If you need to revise these terms then press pause, rewind, get a cup of tea, and I'll wait. You're going to need to know these words if you do any kind of neuroscience research. Okay, now for birds. Here is a European jay, my favourite bird. Birds are a lot like fish, except they swim through the air and don't have scales. There are two additional anatomical terms which are best explained in birds. So like fish, birds do have tails. In Latin, tail is corda, and towards the tail is called caudal. In birds, rostrum is beak, and towards the beak is rostral. So the axis between the beak and the tail is rostrocaudal. These terms are important when we get to humans, so if you need to revise these terms, take a break now. This is a pug called Cooney. Isn't he cute? Dogs are a lot like birds, except for the fur and the wings. So I'm going to put all the anatomical labels so far on this dog. Again, white labels are for directions in space, and yellow labels are for parts of the dog. Now, of course, dogs don't have beaks, but in birds and mammals, we do still use the word rostral, meaning towards the beak. But in mammals it means, I guess, towards the nose or snout. Similarly, towards the tail is still caudal, the back is still dorsal, and the belly is still ventral. In mammals with limbs, which sort of stretch away from the main body, distal and proximal are also really useful terms. Distal means far away, and is often used for the paws, the hand, the feet, fingers and toes, distal extremities. And proximal means nearby. 
And in the hand lab, we would use that for, say, the shoulders and the upper arm. Here I am enjoying an afternoon walk in the English countryside. Humans are a lot like dogs, except for the fur and the tail. I'm going to add all the labels at once. Now, again, I don't have a tail, but the end of my spinal cord is still referred to as caudal. Now, I don't have a beak, but my nose is still rostral. And on this image, you can see my belly, ventral, and my back, dorsal, is away from the camera. Medial, running down my front, is along my midline, and lateral is anywhere away from this midline. There's one final complication which you'll need to be aware of. Fish are straight. The tail, the spine and the head are all in the same line. And that means that the labels at different parts of the body tend to match up with each other. Dorsal with superior and ventral with inferior. But birds, dogs and humans are bent. The tail or legs and the spine and the head are not necessarily in a straight line all the time. And so that makes labelling the different parts of brain and body a bit more complicated. The neuraxis is the axis of the nervous system, including the spinal cord, the brainstem, and the brain. It's blue in this image to distinguish it from the yellow labels which we've been using before. When the long, long ago ancestors of humans stood up on two legs, the neuraxis was bent so that while the spinal cord became vertical, the eyes now pointed forwards. So at the neck, which is labelled caudal here, Ventral is the same as anterior, so towards the front, and dorsal is the same as posterior, towards the back. But as you go up the spinal cord and into the brain and towards the nose, the neuraxis bends over. So when you're all the way at the front of the head, ventral is now in the same direction as inferior towards the feet, while dorsal is the same as superior towards the sky. This can be really confusing when you're looking at brain images or trying to understand the location of brain areas. So make sure you get these terms really clear in your mind and just check how they might be changing as you move through the body and the brain. That's most of the general anatomical words that you'll need. Once you've learned all of these words, you'll be able to identify all sorts of parts of the brain and the body just by their name. Okay, next we're going to look at the bones of the arm and hand. On the left of this image, the main bones are labelled in red. On the top, there's the clavicle or collarbone and the scapula or shoulder blade. The humerus has a ball and socket joint into the shoulder, which allows the upper arm to move very flexibly. The elbow has quite limited range of motion, but the ulna and the radius, the two bones that make up the forearm, can twist around each other to give a really good range of motion at the wrist. On the right side of this image, labelled in blue, are some of the bony bumps that are used uh, as reference points often in EMG or motion tracking studies. At the shoulder is the acromion, the elbow has the medial and lateral epicondyles and the wrist has medial and lateral styloid processes. The hand is fabulously well boned. There are 27 bones shown in this image. Your five digits are made up of two or three phalanges each, with the distal phalanges in red, intermediate in blue and proximal phalanges in green. The joints between the phalanges are your knuckles. The five yellowy bones within your hand are the metacarpals. And the eight purple bones at the end, which form the wrist and twist and rotate with the ulna and the radius bones, are the carpals. Coming out of the spinal cord, the brachial plexus gives out lots of nerves to the arm. Five of them are shown here. Probably the most useful for the hand lab are the three that go all the way to the end of the fingers, the ulna, medial and radial nerves. 
The radial nerve in yellow supplies the side of your hand where the radius bone is. The ulnar nerve in blue supplies the ulnar bone side of your hand. If you've ever hit your funny bone at the elbow on a sharp object or a table, then you'll know which parts of the hand the ulnar nerve supplies. The median nerve, suggested by its name, supplies the bits in between the ulna and the radial nerves. Here's a close-up view of the nerves in the hand. The radial nerve mostly supplies the dorsal, hairier side of the hand. The medial nerve mostly supplies the palmar, or the glabrous, or the sweaty side of the hand. The ulnar nerve mostly supplies both the hairy and the sweaty sides of the hand, but particularly for the little finger and the ulnar half of the ring finger. That's it. That should be more than enough basic anatomy to get you started on any hand-related neuroscience project. For more detail, you should go online, Google it, uh, Wikipedia, find a medical colleague, or at worst case, get yourself a medical anatomy textbook. Thank you.